Next year, of course, is the 40th anniversary of Travis's experience. And Jen and I have been working on this documentary for more than a year with our wonderful cameraman, Bob Terrio, and a great team of people. Um, the working title is Travis, and we're looking to introduce the viewer to who he was back then, how we perceive him now, and how he got through these ridiculously dramatic events in his life. As far as what I'd like to start with, with you is, can you tell us anything about your relationship with Travis when you met him, under what circumstances? Uh, I, I do not know Travis well. Uh, I, I don't know the other witnesses yeah. well either. I'm not an expert on this case. Understood. I have interviewed Travis. I interviewed him, uh, for, I met him in person at a UFO conference the first time. I interviewed him for the radio, for a Coast to Coast program, along with some of the other guys who were part of his crew. Uh, over the years, I've interacted with him at different conferences and events. I got to know him a little bit. I, I find him to be uh, the genuine article. I, yeah. I think he's a believable guy. I, I'm an investigative reporter. I've been in the business <laughs> for about 30 years. Uh, a lot of times you have to rely on your gut in this business. You have to be able to read people a little bit. And my reading of him is that he's he is the real deal, that he's a, a legitimate guy and he's telling the truth and recounting events that really happened to him. Yeah. As an investigative writer, big difference from investigative reporter or journalist, I've known Travis, also met him at a conference originally 20 odd years ago. He didn't seem to me like somebody who like you or me likes to be up on that stage and you know telling our stories and filling people in on information. I got the sense he was up there because he felt he had to be to lay this thing out for regular folks to try to wrap their heads around. I've even heard him say, if somebody told me this story, I think they're out of their mind or a liar. I mean, how can you believe it? except that it happened. <clears throat> now, a question for you that's fascinated me is, unlike any other UFO story that's ever come our way, here's this guy, he's a logger. He's out doing his work, this incredible thing happens. His buddies go back to town, they're in shock. They decide to do the right thing and go to the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> go to the police and tell them what happened. Now, that immediately makes the law enforcement folks feel that um, the other alternative to being abducted by a flying saucer is that maybe, you know, these rough and tumble guys got into a fight. One thing led to another. A terrible accident happened. He was killed. They hit his body. And so commences five days of searches in the woods. Now, the novelty of the UFO abduction story and a murder story went out on the wire services around the world. So by the time he was returned, five days later, this was international news. And this guy from a small town in Arizona had to deal with that. Any thoughts or comments around that? Uh, you know, back in those days, uh, when this became news, all that we now know about alien abductions, the whole alien abduction scenario was not widely known. This was uh, before Whitley Strieber, before Bud Hopkins' uh, main, main books, before this had seeped into the general public. As you say, it was still really new and sensational. But Travis's story uh, sort of is a, is a bedrock of what we now know as the alien abduction scenario. The, the kinds of things that happened to him, some of those same things have been repeated over and over for thousands and thousands of other people around the world. So the consistency of his story is, is a, a strong thing for me. Uh, the fact that he hasn't had, that he's, that he's maintained the same story over the years, that he hasn't added to it or exaggerated things. The fact that he remembers this stuff, not under hypnosis, but with his conscious memory is, is uh, a major deal for me. The fact that all the stories of all these primary witnesses have remained the same. Um, that suggests that what happened to them, what was described to them, really did happen. These guys uh, went to the cops, um, which, you know, people have tried to make a big deal out of that. Well, maybe they thought he was dead. The fact is, he wasn't dead. He, he was really missing. He was actually gone. Another argument in his favor. I mean, nobody knows where he was. If, if he wasn't on this spaceship, where the hell was he? <laughs> um, all those factors uh, suggest to me that he's telling the truth. Yeah. Um, if you were trying to cover something up, if you were pulling a hoax on the community, do you go and report it to the police? I, I don't think so. 
uh, thank you for what I always felt was the most common sense approach to this. It, it, it defies all deceptive logic, so to say. And speaking about deceptive logic, the name Philip J. Class, as my sister used to refer to him, Philip Class, the man who does not have class. Um, he enters into this story in terms of uh, the unofficial debunker in charge in the United States and treated Travis in his writings and his lectures with such extraordinary contempt, disdain, um, the most silly flip arguments to counter Travis's uh, stated case. Had you ever had any um, uh, thing happen with him yourself? Uh, can you give us a little window in on that? You know, by the end of Phil Class's life, he had become this grandfatherly sage, <laughs> this, this wise man of ufology. He <laughs> mellowed quite a bit. Yes. And I developed a relationship with him Good. Uh, from afar, yeah. pen pal sort of, where we would, he would write and ask me a question. I'd send him something back, and it was relatively friendly. But it wasn't always that way. In, in the very beginning, when I started uh, looking at U, UFOs, the UFO topic, back in the, in the late 80s, yeah. Phil Class suddenly appeared on the scene. Uh, you know, we had done these shows with John Lear on the on television here in, in Las Vegas, these little talk shows that would run at 6 o'clock in the morning that presumably no one would see it. <laughs> and suddenly, uh, after I did two of those, Phil Class comes to town. Hey, I want to do an interview. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, all right. I, I, I didn't really know who he was, but and we had him on the show. We recorded it. I subsequently used bits and pieces of that live interview in uh, some UFO productions that we did, UFOs, The Best Evidence, a documentary about uh, UFOs in general and Area 51 in specific. Phil Class came after me. Uh, he wanted to get me fired. Uh, he wrote letters to my boss. He threatened lawsuits. Um, he tried to create a lot of tr trouble for me. And we oh. went back and forth for a while. It was a very hostile relationship. But I got a little tiny taste of what Phil Class could do. In reading what he did to Travis... Uh, I see that that was a that was a much different Phil class than the Phil class that I got to know in his last few years of life. Yeah. Uh, it was nasty stuff, and I, I think it's a, an argument in Travis's favor is the lengths to which the opponents would go to discredit a story, yeah. the dirty tricks that were played on Travis and the other guys, the the disparaging of their character, the 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 lies and distortions that were made, the offers of money. Hey, if you'll change your story, I'll give you some money. Yeah. Th that that speaks volumes to me is how far people would go to try and discredit this story. But the fact is they weren't able to do it. Yeah. Despite all the dirty tricks and nasty stuff pulled by Phil Class and others, that story has stood the test of time. Ridicule in UFOs as a very powerful weapon to uh, condition the American people going back to the summer of 47 has been an absolute point of fascination for me and an area of very specific research over the years. Um, would you agree that it really has been the most powerful weapon to keep people from even beginning to look at the truth? and? Any examples in your work where ridicule has come to the surface as a very effective tool in this? Well, I've had to deal with it every step of the way yeah. in my professional life. I mean, before I became a UFO guy, <laughs> I was a pretty respected reporter. <laughs> to, a, to a large extent, I still am. Because yes. people knew me here in Las Vegas before I got involved in studying and, and reporting on UFOs, right. I had a certain amount of credibility built, with, built up with them. Uh, I didn't just, I wasn't just an unknown guy who had jumped into the deep end of the pool here. Uh, because they knew me and trusted me, I was able to get away with it and still am. Yeah. But despite that fact, uh, over the years, I mean, every time I get into an argument with somebody, uh, other media colleagues, that's what they trot out is the UFO stuff. Well, George is talking to little green men. He's got a, an alien beanie on. They make some wisecrack about, look, there's Elvis. Look, there's Bigfoot the same tired stuff over and over again and it works to some extent yeah but the, the, it only goes as far as i think people in the media allow it to go and my colleagues in journalism are the ones who seem most threatened by the ufo story yeah. and the ufo reality yeah. they're the ones who don't want people like me taking it seriously yeah. and they're the ones who you know the radio djs the and uh, columnists um Anybody I have any kind of a disagreement with on anything, that's what they bring out. So ridicule is very real. Yeah. I haven't allowed it to affect me, but it does affect people. It does intimidate witnesses, and it's not an accident, Peter. As you yeah. know, 
uh, the Robertson panel that was convened by the CIA back in the early 50s, yep. talked about this. They said, look, we've, we're worried about where this UFO thing is going. We need to do something about it. And what we need to do is strip UFOs of their aura of mystery yeah. and do, in effect, they recommended a policy of debunking. They wanted to bring Walt Disney and Arthur Godfrey That's into right. a, a massive media campaign to make fun of people to intimidate witnesses, to make them not come forward and talk about their experiences. And to a large extent, it's worked. People will, I meet people every single day, everywhere I go, who want to tell me their UFO story exactly. or some alien abduction encounter or some weird thing they've seen in the sky. There, it, there's trepidation there. They're worried about how I'm going to react. They know because I've covered it that I have an interest in this subject, but still, they're careful about what they say because they don't want people to think they're crazy. Well... You know, there probably are some people who are crazy who make <laughs> oh, stuff yeah. up. Travis Walton isn't one of them. No. Uh, he reminds me a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Bob Lazar. And I don't think Travis would would want necessarily to be compared to Bob Lazar, but I can't help notice uh, some similarities in that they're both sort of reluctant UFO messiahs. You know, neither one of those guys is really uh, comfortable with public speaking. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not out there uh, hawking a bunch of stuff. Uh, they're, they, they've been pulled into this, into t telling their story by people like you and by people like me. Yeah. And their story has remained consistent. They haven't added to it. They haven't subtracted from it. And it's supported by other witnesses and materials. So uh, in a lot of ways, I think of Travis as, as comparable to Bob Lazar. And I believe both of those stories. By yeah. Way. Amen to that. Um, George, for the closing of our film, we're looking for statement from experts about the real nature of the universe and regular folks on their take. Now, in your wonderful uh, talk at the MUFON Symposium last month, you recounted an amazing story uh, in your presentation about Ben Rich. Would you mind just sort of recounting it, us for, it for us here? If anyone were to know what the truth is about UFOs and their interaction with us, it would be Ben Rich. There, he, He's the Skunk Works guy. He's a brilliant man, an engineer, who helped develop some of the most important uh, uh, spy platforms and spy planes that we've ever had, the SR-71 and the A-12 and the, uh, the U-2. Yeah. Uh, he's a brilliant man, and, and his Skunk Works operation basically formed Area 51. So all of the most advanced secret warplanes and secret... Uh, technological uh, research in the world has gone on there. The deepest, darkest, blackest projects in the U.S. government. So if anyone knows what is going on there, it's the guy that runs the place, and that's Ben Rich. And he made a couple of statements uh, toward the end of his life that give us insight into uh, what he might have known. He, he wrote some letters to friends of mine where he talked about UFOs. Do you believe in UFOs? And he said, yeah, I do. I believe in both kinds. I believe in unfunded opportunities, and I believe in those other things. <laughs> um, so he gave hints that, that maybe he knew more than, more than he had let on to. But then he gave a speech at UCLA in which he said, we already have the ability to take E.T. home. We have the power to travel to the stars. We can do it. Anything you can imagine, we can do it right now. But this technology is so deep in the black world, it will never be unlocked. It suggests to me, he said there was some kind of a calculation that we humans had wrong. And once they figured it out, they knew that we could travel to the stars. That suggests to me they had some help, uh, that we have some technology that came from somewhere else, or at least they can duplicate what others, other beings in other worlds might have. And I believe Ben Rich was telling us that that technology exists, and we're probably never going to see it. The military's got it. They've got it wrapped up. The same kinds of things that Bob Lazar said were true, the same kind of technology that Travis Walton was exposed to, I think it's out there somewhere. Mm. Also, in, in your MUFON presentation, you quoted Jacques Vallée as hinting that the visitors we have coming to Earth is not the real problem we're facing. And is that something that you'd be willing to elaborate on a little bit here? I remember the first time I ever interviewed Jacques Vallée, who I consider to be the most important thinker on this topic ever. And he told me, you know, I'm going to be really disappointed if the answer to the UFO mystery is something as simple as people from other planets traveling here in spaceships. <laughs> he thinks that uh, be because of the evidence that he has seen over the 40, 50 years he's been studying mm. it, 
that these uh, beings, wherever they're from, can manipulate space-time. They can manipulate gravity. They could thus be from other planets. They could be extraterrestrials, time travelers, all of the above. Uh, the fact is, as Jacques has pointed out in many of his books, we don't know where they're from. They sometimes appear to us as aliens, and we think that they're extraterrestrials, but they sometimes appear in many other kinds of forms as well. And the fact is, we humans have reported hundreds of different variations of these visitors throughout all time, on every continent, in every culture, throughout human history. Yeah. We can call them elves, we can call them fairies, goblins, monsters. Somehow, they're all related. And somehow, they give us a hint that reality, as we know it, uh, is, is off, that, that our concept of reality is wrong, that, that as Jock said, the universe is much bigger, much more wondrous than we can possibly imagine. UFOs, the kinds of experiences that Travis Walton have, give us a little tiny glimpse into that, mm. uh, but I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. I don't think we understand it yet. I look forward to finding out, though. Yeah, okay. Um, a personal question. Did you grow up with a fascination for this subject, or really was it your investigative work that got you into it? Did you grow up thinking that we were alone in the universe or, you know, a, a more conservative view? And is, again, your professional involvement in the subject what opened you up? Or you always had that kind of, uh, you know, a mind that was thinking about things like? Oh, um, I'm not sure how to answer that. <laughs> uh, it's, not a, it's not a question that dominated my life until uh, it popped up here in Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, it did. It is a subject that came up in my my personal life over the years as a kid and with my parents, but not often. I did. I had one UFO book, I think, uh, in my life. Uh, it was the book about Billy Meyer, those beam ship oh, photographs yeah. that someone had given me a, as a Christmas present. But it's not. It's something I would think about once in a while, like anybody else. But sure. certainly not something that dominated uh, my thoughts until I started hearing about Area Fifty One. Yeah, and then started following the paper trail of the, the UFO cover-up, uh, and I was hooked after that. But yeah. it's not something I, uh, I dealt with most of my life, no. Yeah. Okay. Any closing thoughts relative to Travis Walton? How his event may, in the long run, help to bring people into being more accepting of this alternate reality, of him as an individual, or your take on the whole subject and where it may be going? Well, I think Travis Walton's story is true, and I think there are multiple indications of why it's true. Multiple witnesses who all tell the same story. Multiple witnesses who passed polygraphs, despite efforts to cloud the, cloud the waters, the muddy the waters on those polygraphs, they passed. Uh, how did they do that? The fact that their stories remain consistent, they have added to it over the years, uh, the fact that they went to law enforcement, and the sheer evidence that so many people went to such great lengths to discredit them yeah. suggests that something really important happened here. We now know from uh, that thousands and thousands of other people around the world have had experiences similar to Travis's. He didn't know that at the time. He hadn't read a whole bunch of alien abduction books because the books didn't exist at the time. So I think his story is true. I think it gives us a little bit of glimpse into a much bigger and more mysterious world I hope uh, Travis gets final answers someday. I hope we all do. Yes, indeed. George Knapp, thank you for s so much for spending this time with us, and God bless and see you around the campus. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.